Okay guys, it's uh, lesson 16. It's time for some Diffusion Monte Carlo, and we're gonna touch again on the variational method. I'll basically just recap what we said last time. It's such a simple idea. It doesn't really require much, but, uh, but I wanna just reinforce what we already talked about. Let's go back to this guy. Do you remember this equation? I guess you probably do. It's nothing other than the Schrodinger equation. The, uh, <clears throat> the left-hand term just says the time evolution of the wave function uh, is proportional to the total energy operator, the Hamiltonian operator, acting on the wave function. Now, of course, the Hamiltonian is made up of kinetic energy part and a potential energy part. So nothing new here, but... Uh, Interestingly, if I replace the time variable with a minus i times tau, so we make a variable substitution, essentially, um, and then clear out the i's, divide the i's out, and multiply through by minus 1, we get the following result. Uh, that is, the time derivative of this wave function thing uh, goes like the... Uh, second spatial derivative minus the potential energy function times the wave function again, uh, I want you to notice that that's looking an awful lot like the diffusion equation. If we, uh, if we imagine adding an offset to the energy, call it ER, and uh, more about that in a minute, but uh, if we add an offset to the energy, notice that what we have here it's sort of like uh, when you have diffusing, a diffusing gas or a diffusing um, material embedded in some other material, for example. You know that the time rate of change of the concentration of the stuff that you're following um, depends on something like a diffusion constant times the second spatial derivative of the concentration. And then if there is a source of this stuff, it would appear as a source term. And, uh, and this equation, even though it's the Schrodinger equation with the time replaced with a minus i times tau, um, it looks exactly like the diffusion equation. And so the notion is that if you understand the diffusion equation and you understand how to solve it, you can use that understanding to solve the Schrodinger equation. That's the underlying sort of insight to Diffusion Monte Carlo. So I'm going to skip now to look at the Computing Project 4 handout, and I'll just sort of touch on the highlights of that. Of course, you can read it and uh, see how it goes and ask questions if you, if you have trouble. But I thought it would be worthwhile to just sort of go through it bit by bit uh, in the slides so you could see how that goes. Okay, so this is Computing Project 4. And uh, it's about Diffusion Monte Carlo. And you'll recognize these equations. These are right out of the slides. The Schrodinger equation, what you get when you replace the time with the complex time, what happens when you clear some signs, and finally, what you end up with. Now, one thing I want to point out is that uh, if you have a eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, of course, you get the eigenvalue that goes with it. If I were to add an offset to the Hamiltonian, just a constant offset, what it would do, you, you, your eigenstates would still be solutions to the original equation, but now the eigenvalues would simply get that offset. So the eigenvalues would change, but the eigenvectors would be the same. That's an important point. Now, the thing is, um, if I... Uh, if I rewrite that a little bit, let's see, and I write an arbitrary ket as a superposition of eigenkets, with the original Schrodinger equation, of course, if I, uh, if I add a constant offset to the Hamiltonian, that just adds a constant offset to the omegas. And uh, that doesn't actually have any physical impact, because we all know that if you multiply a wave function by a constant phase, even if it's a superposition state with multiple different eigenvalues, that constant phase just hits all the eigenvalues, or hits all the components of the wave function, and when you compute anything physical, it doesn't really make any difference. But if we change this from a complex exponential to a real exponential, like <coughs> this, with the diffusion equation, then notice that adding or subtracting a constant to the Hamiltonian 
adds or subtracts a constant to all these real exponential terms. Now the thing is, I, wa I want you to focus on the ground state for a second. If we were to add the ground state energy in such a way that the, let me say that again. If we were to add an energy to the Hamiltonian such that the ground state energy became zero, then as the time progressed, notice that the factor multiplying the ground state wave function would just be one, e to the minus zero times tau. But all the higher energy states would have a positive constant here because they would all have energies greater than the ground state energy. And so they would naturally decay out in time because the, when you change the time to an imaginary time, then these guys all become um, all become real exponentials that decay. The only one that wouldn't decay would be the ground state because if you could set the offset energy equal to the ground state energy. So here's the idea. We fiddle with the offset such that the number of walkers, here, so here's the plan. You, you make a bunch of walkers, they're just random uh, representations of positions in the state space of the eigenfunction. They're basically, you think of them as little guys that wander around in quantum state space. And uh, they get born in those regions where the source term is large. Let's go back and look at the diffusion equation again. Where this term is large, you create walkers. Where this term is small, you destroy walkers. And you adjust this energy, E sub r, so that the number of walkers remains relatively constant. When you do that, it turns out the wave function that survives after you run this thing for a long time is the ground state wave function because all the higher order eigenstates decay away as a consequence of that real exponential effect. So we can rescale the equation. We rescale the distance with a length scale, rescale the time with a time scale, rescale the energy with an energy scale, and uh, <coughs> the equation under those circumstances looks like this. And uh, basically we get to choose the length scale and the time scale, for example, and then the energy scale gets dictated, or we could do it the other way around. Um, and we can talk about that, that in class. The, the technical details of scaling the equation uh, are a little bit tricky, but the main idea is we adopt position, time, and energy units to make the equation simple. And, uh, and then we run this algorithm, the Walker algorithm, in time so that it correctly represents a diffusion process. And what we end up with is the diffusion of walkers around in such a way that their average <laughs> position, that their average concentration, is proportional to the ground state wave function. That's the idea. Now there are a couple of Python tricks I want to point out to you guys. Here's the basic code, which of course you can read. I'm not, I'm not going to explain every single line. But the main point is this flat non-zero function is probably the most different, most distinct function to one you've used before. And what it does is it finds, it computes the indices of an array that satisfy a certain condition. So flat non-zero returns a set of indices where this number is greater than zero. Uh, this number is described in the paper that I'll hand out in class today. But basically, it, it's a measure of whether or not uh, we want to keep the walkers around in a certain location, or we want to kill them, or we want to create more. So if the condition is satisfied, we want to keep these walkers. If, the, if this condition is satisfied, we want to actually make more walkers. And if neither of these conditions is satisfied, then the walkers, we want to let them go. So basically, in regions where the potential is low, we want to make walkers. In regions where the potential is high, we want to destroy walkers. And, uh, and the flat non-zero is an easy way to go find the indices of walkers that satisfy a certain criteria. Take goes and pulls those walkers out. And, uh, and the nice thing about these functions is that we can they're very efficient, and we can use them without having to write a bunch of loops. So we don't have to iterate through all the walkers to discover which ones satisfy a condition. We simply 
call flat non-zero, it very efficiently finds all the indices where this condition is satisfied, take very efficiently goes and pulls those guys out. And, uh, and that's the way the thing works. And now let's, uh, let's look at a demonstration of that code to see what it actually does. And uh, we'll be right back. Yet uh, to get really good results, and, and we're only running 1,000 walkers. So uh, we're going to find out that the, the biggest limitation to this algorithm is time. It takes time for the thing to converge. And that's where the parallel computing comes in. Later in the semester, we'll be invoking multiple computers working in tandem to compute uh, Monte Carlo quantum ground state wave functions. All right, very good. Finally, let's just quickly review the variational principle. The notion of the variational principle is that if you compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian using any old wave function at all, the number you're going to get is always going to be greater than or equal to the ground state energy. So that suggests uh, an, a way to discover what the ground state wave function is and what the ground state energy is. So you just parameterize a wave function any old way you like, superpositions of Fourier terms or uh, exponentials or Gaussians or whatever, whatever you think is going to give you a good answer. And then you simply adjust the parameters of that wave function to minimize the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Assuming you know the Hamiltonian, you can always calculate an uh, approximate wave function and compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And by fiddling with the parameters of the wave function, you can make the expectation value as small as you like. So that's basically the idea of the variational principle. We're going to get some experience with that uh, in the next couple lessons to see how that works. But, uh, but that's the notion, and that's really all there is to it. All right, we'll see you guys next time.